Our guest today, Allison Handy, is a partner of Perkins Cooey out in Seattle. Allison is one of those lawyers that seems to be an expert in everything. <laughs> it almost scares me, but she's a wonderful person. She's one of the first people I actually talked to when I was thinking about this project. So I'm so grateful that she can join us. I'm Brock Romanek today on Zippy Point. So Allison, poison pills, quite a hot topic last year. What is a poison pill and how does it work? So um, poison pills have been around for a long time. They came out first in the 1980s and really it's sort of a threat, right? It's, it's how do we stop someone in their tracks, a hostile bidder? Um, so um, it's, it's, a, it's a forcing mechanism. It's something that causes a hostile bidder to have to talk to the board rather than just going out to the shareholders. Um, so it, it's a basically your, your standard anti-takeover device um, and they've been very common, but they've really sort of evolved over the years. So um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about how the plan actually works. What is the threat? What is it that the company's threatening to do? Um, basically the, the board adopts the plan and gives rights to every shareholder. And then if a shareholder comes along and crosses the threshold that's in that plan, and we'll talk a little bit more about thresholds in a bit, but something like 15%, 20%, they, they get up to you know 15 or 20% of the company's outstanding shares. The, um, that is when the, the plan flips into place. Um, and so I, have, I shared with you, uh, Barack, a, a spreadsheet. You can pop that up if you want just to talk a little about, I think it's helpful to have the numbers in front of you when you're thinking about, you know, what, what this is actually, what's actually happening. So um, basically, you know, you've got your current share price here in this example, company's got a share price of $60. They set their exercise price for those rights, $150. Um, and what happens when when the sort of the, the flip happens, when, when the plan is triggered, um, everyone other than that raider, that acquiring person who in this example, you know, gets 15%, everybody else has a right that says, okay, you can now buy more shares of our stock. Sometimes it's preferred, sometimes it's common, but effectively more shares of the stock um, for a really low price. So in this example, with an exercise price of $150, you get the, the everyone else gets to buy shares basically at half the current share price. So here, if it's $150, the current share price is 60, you get five shares for your $150. The effect of that, and you can see the little charts here, before the flip in happens, that rater has 15%. If you've got, you know, fully, you know, you've got plenty of shares, you're doing it with um, preferred or, or, or whatever the structure is, and there's plenty authorized. After the flip-in, if everybody buys those shares, you know, the everybody exercises their rights other than that raider, the raider is left with less than 3% of the company. So this is a huge dilution. This is a real threat. Um, and, and I think, you know, it's helpful to kind of understand that before you, you know, when you're talking about what a plan is. So I'll talk a little bit more a little later about some of like the very special features and different things you can put in with a rights plan, but it's kind of helpful to have that basic understanding of what actually happens. It's a very significant dilution and a reduction in value for that, um, for that, you know, uh, hostile potential acquirer. Um, so it's a real threat. And you know, I'll say these have only been triggered a few times over the years. There's there's a couple of them, but for the most part, you know, the board puts it up and that basically prevents someone from uh, from going over the threshold. They might go right up to that threshold, um, but then they have to go talk to the board. If they want to acquire the company, you know, they're going to have to talk to the board because you, so you get out of the plan, you exempt yourself from the plan if the board approves the transaction that that uh, acquirer is proposing. So that's kind of the, the basics. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I remember uh, I was practicing when poison pills sort of became in vogue and then I don't know, Marty Lipton invent them. I, yeah, I think so. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, I was around and they were quite controversial and 
uh, in the news a lot, and they actually haven't been in the news for a really long time. So it was interesting with mm -hmm. the market collapse last year, how yeah. they quickly got into the news. So if, if the poison pill is such a powerful tool for deterring hostile takeovers, why are they so controversial? Yeah, and that's, it is interesting because it's, you can see the benefit here, right? You, one of the primary fiduciary duties of the board is to prevent somebody from getting, taking control without pay, paying a premium for that control, right? That's something you want the board of your company to be able to do. But shareholders, you know, are, uh, some groups of investors, some groups of shareholders are very distrustful of the board or management, right? They, they, think perhaps that the board or management is really just trying to preserve their own positions rather than doing what's maybe in the best interest of all shareholders. And so I think the what makes it controversial is those shareholders and investors out there who, who just view plans as a management entrenchment device. Um, they've been litigated very thoroughly in Delaware. Um, you talked about, you know, back in the 80s, they were litigated back then. Um, you know, more recently, I think it was, uh, I'm going to get this wrong, 2013, I think, 2012, 2013, um, there was also litigation over sort of a new twist on the plan with the two tiers where um, basically the company said, okay, we're going to set it at a 15% threshold, but if it's a, a form, a 13D filer, someone who has come out and said they are trying to make changes at the company, they are talking to management, they want management to do something. Um, those people, the, in, in the plan that was at issue in this case, um, they set a 10% threshold for people like that. I think it was or maybe that was a 1520. Sometimes it's 1015, sometimes it's 1520. But setting multiple tiers to say there are, you know, there's a concern where sometimes the board really needs that number to be lower because you can get, you know, there might be some credible threat um, to the company at a lower threshold, uh, you know, get, depending on what the company's existing ownership is, depending on what the threat is. Maybe it's not a hostile takeover. Maybe it's somebody who's just trying to, you know, bring in new new directors um, or or make some other changes at the company. Um, they might be a much more credible threat to the company at a lower number. The Delaware uh, courts have even said that, you know, that is okay. But the the real sort of the key for companies as they're thinking about putting in a plan and, you know, defending it, especially in a Delaware court, um, the, the test is whether the board had a reasonable belief of a threat of the corp, uh, to the corporate policy and effectiveness of the company, and whether the terms of the pill are a proportional response to that threat. Um, so, even the Delaware courts recognize, you know, yes, this is a really powerful tool that the board can use to prevent someone from gaining control of the company uh, without paying a premium. But you really have to be proportional. You can't just stop all takeover um, advances just because you want to keep you want to keep operating the company. You know, that might not be in the best interest of all shareholders. So that's kind of where the, the courts have come down on it. Um, I'll also mention, um, you know, when I was talking before about who, you know, who, who objects. And uh, one kind of key drivers on structuring rights plans and, and how they've changed in the last 20 years um, is ISS and Glass-Lewis, right? So, you know, back late 90s, lots of companies had these 10-year plans. They just put them up. Just going to have, this is one of our anti-takeover devices. We've got a classified board. We've got, you know, limitations on shareholders calling meetings. All the, We're just going to put up a 10-year plan. Um, and that's going to, you know, it's just out there. It's one of our, our normal protections. Um, right now, both ISS and Glass-Lewis have voting policies that effectively discourage companies from adopting anything more than a one-year plan. So I says, okay, if it adopt a one-year plan, um, after that, they really expect you to go out and get shareholder approval of it. But even if you, even if you 
want shareholder approval, they have sort of some specific things they want to see in your plan, some certain features. Um, I've got them listed here. They, um, nothing below a 20% trigger. They don't like the 15%. Nothing more than a three-year term. Nothing that would limit the ability of the a future board to redeem that pill. Basically bring back the rights in and, and cancel the pill. And, and they also want to see a provision allowing shareholders to force the board to redeem the pill. So, you know, they, those things, those drivers have really changed the structure of how, um, how companies are, are designing their pills. Um, and I'd say what you see more often now, and like uh, you mentioned before, the um, uptick in pills since, uh, since the market has uh, been bumpy uh, since uh, coronavirus and other reasons, but um, in, in, in sort of volatile months, companies are adopting these, they're usually adopting a month pill because they don't want to have, they don't want to go get shareholder approval for them. It's usually for a more limited purpose for, um, you know, some immediate threat. Uh, and and the, there's no longer this sort of just pill that's outstanding and, and a, a general anti-takeover. Do companies sort of shop a poison pill idea with their largest shareholders, or is that potentially a reg FD violation? Because the, does the announcement of a poison pill mm -hmm. normally move this price the market? Um, you know, I see. I I don't. I think it. I think it can have an impact on the price um, in the market. I I do think. I mean, you know, different investors view it differently. I think some view it as a positive. The company. Um, you know, it, it's stability. It really, it, it really depends on what the company is, um, you know, what their specific situation is. So it can, you know, cause a, a change. It's, it's absolutely viewed as material in terms of, you know, you must do an 8K, you must um, file the, you know, yeah, it, you're, it's an amendment to your charter typically, because you're usually, it's put in place with preferred stock. And so you have to do a certificate designations, to sort of designate the rights of the, the preferred that would be ill um, on exercise. So all other means, you know, you're, it, it's, it's treated as material information for sure. And then what sort of SEC filings would there, I guess it'd be an 8K if you're amending your charter. Um, and an 8A and an for 8A, the, the right. new rights. Mm -hmm. Um, <laughs> yeah, and the, the nice thing is, the nice thing is that the, the pills, you know, there's a couple forms out there, but they all have like an a, attachment to the pill that basically is the press release. <laughs> um, I mean, well, the, you, you know, you, you typically you're going to put out a press release that's a couple paragraphs, kind of explain to the market, this is why we're adopting it. This is the either there's a specific threat or, you know, the company has a reason that they, they want to do this. Um, and then there's uh, the the attachment to the rights plan that says like that, that summarizes all those different provisions and some of those special um, special uh, aspects that you know the things that ISS or Glass Lewis prefer um, those are sort of summarized in it so the the lawyers have to read the whole thing and remind themselves how it works but um, but there is a nice summary tucked in <laughs> so if the proxy advisors are discouraging pills that are long term. How does a board put a pill, you know, on the shelf? Yeah, so that's the that's the preferred method these days. Having one on the shelf basically means educating your board about pills. So, um, you know, it's not a bad idea to do any time, you know, shortly after your IPO or at an annual strategy meeting, just kind of regularly reminding your board, we have these anti-takeover devices already. But here's one more that we um, can have at hand, but you need to know about it. You, you know, in order for the board to exercise its fiduciary duties and um, show that it knew what it was doing in adopting a pill and, and sort of knew what the consequences were and what it might mean to the market, you talk, talk about it. Have, bring in your, your lawyers once a year, have them uh, do a little presentation, get one of those nice charts that I, uh, I showed you. And uh, and explain how it works, when it might be useful, what you know, what you might, what characteristics you might want in it. It's also, um, I think, a good idea to sort of float it with your uh, transfer agent. The way it works, the way the rights agreement works, is it's an agreement between the company and the transfer agent. And so, 
they sometimes have their own view on them. They might want specific provisions. They might want to limit their own liability. You know, there, there's some sort of technicalities in there. So, so having your transfer agent review it so it's ready to be adopted on the moment's notice because that's when it usually needs to be adopted. You know, you've got um, these days with uh, the 10 day delay between um, someone, you know, a 13D filer going over the, the threshold and when they actually need to make that 13D filing, they can accumulate a lot of stock in that time. So you might, a 13D filing might come up and you see we've got, you know, a 14% shareholder. A board might want to adopt a pill over the weekend. You know, it's, it, it can need to happen very quickly. So putting it on the shelf means educating your board and being ready to adopt sort of at the drop of the hat. It also seems like an important question to ask your transfer agent now well before you need the poison pill to make sure they can handle it in yeah. case you need, might need to change your transfer agent if they can't accommodate the kind of pill that you might need. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So the questions that the board should consider when someone like, when Allison comes into the boardroom to explain what this, what this is all about and then... <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Hand out the questions in advance. Hey, you should ask me these questions. <laughs> that is always the way I do it too. I like to give the board the questions they should ask. <laughs> so, um, yeah, the first one I think is really that Delaware test, right? So is there a reasonable, reasonable belief of a threat to corporate policy and effectiveness? And is the adoption of the pill uh, proportional to that threat? So, you know, you can look at Delaware law, look at those specific cases out there, but Really what the kind of that's the bottom line of what the board should be thinking about. Do is is there a real threat that we're trying to address and is this an appropriate response to it? My next question is uh, what other corporate defenses does the company have and what other defensive tools could the board um, consider? So like I, you know we've talked about a little before things like um, classified board. You know there are still a couple companies out there with classified boards probably not in the S&P 500 anymore, but, but some others. And that's another sort of very effective defensive mechanism. You know, you can't have somebody come in and just put up a whole nude slate. They might only get a third of the board at a time. That's, um, you know, if you've got that, you can think about, is that enough for us in this particular situation? You know, there's other um, sort of general defenses. Some states have, um, have, statutes, statutory provisions. I'm in Washington. We have a very protective uh, provision. So a Washington incorporated uh, company might, you know, rely on um, the, the statutory protections against acquisitions uh, like this. So you just, you know, think about what else you have. Does it really, is it necessary to draw the attention to yourself that comes with adopting? Um, what messages does the adoption of the pill send to the market? That's my, my third question. Um, so, you know, are you uh, signaling to the market that you, that there might be some potential acquirers out there that think you're in play? Uh, you know, that's not something that the board necessarily wants to signal. So it's, it's something to, to give some thought to before you, uh, before you jump in. And then a couple more sort of real narrow questions. You know, what's the appropriate ownership threshold for triggering the pill? Is it 15%, which is kind of the, you know, that's, that's the Delaware statutory provision on um, the, the protective Delaware any takeover provision. So is, is it 15%? Do you want 20? Do you want 10? Is there a specific reason that um, you need something different? And then the, the, you know, are there any particular features you want? Do you want to put in place a three-year pill that complies with the ISS rules because you're concerned about a, a longer term situation, you know? Go look at the ISS requirements. Could you live with those? Um, you know, is, would, would that work for this particular company? Or, uh, you know, Glass-Lewis, I think, requires um, what's called a qualifying offer, which means that um, you, it basically gives the potential acquirer the right to kind of do an end run around the board, where they can basically ask uh, the shareholders to, um, to, to force the board to call a special uh, shareholder meeting on whether to exempt the offer. So there's, there's some, like, different kind of last look, 
or you know, there, there's all these different features and plans. Not all of them have them. And when you look at what's been adopted in the last six months, even you'll see a variety. Not everyone's adopting the same thing. So, looking around, really considering what makes sense for the particular company. Great stuff. So informative. And thanks for your time and effort. Thanks, yeah. Allison. Thank you.